All right, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, very pleased to be with you today to, uh, to talk to you about a subject that I've done an awful lot of work on over the last five years. And I'll kind of guide you through the transition of, of how it started and how I got into this and where we've gone since it's, it's begun. Um, I apologize, I, as was mentioned, as Xavier mentioned, I'm a native of, of Western Canada. So in school, I studied French as my second language. And so my Spanish is very poor, but I've been studying Spanish. Uh, one of my children is in Spanish immersion in school. And, uh, uh, but very early on learning Spanish. So I can say things like, uh, mi perro es grande. Uh, so if that happens to come up in the presentation today, it may be useful, but I, I kind of doubt it. So um, with that, uh, we'll, we'll get going into uh, Blue Muda and uh, what really what it is and, and can it work for you there in, in Spain. All right. So let's talk about the transition zone, a climate um, across the, the world, really. And it's, it's an area between warm uh, areas and cool areas. So we are in the middle of that and we get a mix of both. We typically have hot summers in the transition zone and we have cold winters in the transition zone. And it makes it really difficult to grow grass here because there's no grass that is suited to grow with those kind of conditions. And so our warm season grasses like Bermuda grass don't like the cold winters. And oftentimes we will see winter kill death of Bermuda grass um, with extremely cold winters. Cool season grasses on the other hand, don't like the hot summers and um, they will struggle during the, uh, the hot summers and get diseased and, and thin out, uh, become stressed. Uh, and so not a good place to be, be growing grasses. The other interesting thing about the transition zone is it appears to be moving north. And uh, I say that because we've all heard about global warming at this point. And the, the people that have, were, were traditionally growing Bermuda grass were much farther south and only a little bit where I live, but it is moving much farther north uh, because it's, a, it's an interesting, interesting grass. Um, but because of these hot summers, it, it makes it a choice for uh, people, even in the, the northern most climates. So looking at this transition zone across the United States, this light green patch here really stretches from the East Coast over to, let me see if I can minimize this, um, over to the East Coast, over to the West Coast, really goes all the way down into the Los Angeles, California area down through here. Even Northern California would be considered the transition zone. And if you look at the climate of Spain, Southern France, and I would even continue on into uh, Northern Italy, uh, your color there is exactly the same as ours in the transition zone. So your climate in Spain is very much similar to ours in the transition zone of the United States. And now looking at uh, this map of, of uh, the United States, the transition zone, again, this, uh, this area right through here, all the way over to California. So from Maryland to California, here's where I live right here in Kentucky. And so looking at this map from 1990, we can see that we are mostly this, this darker blue. Down here in Tennessee, they're mixed with this darker blue as well as, as this lighter blue. Those are zones of adaptation of where plants can, can grow. And so if we look at this map switch from 1990, watch how this converts from 1990 to 2012, that light blue encompasses most of the state of Tennessee and is now moving up into Kentucky. And so we're getting warmer and warmer. Our climate is warming up. And so it makes more sense that we're growing more and more Bermuda grass uh, in, in northern locations. Now, looking at the climate of Spain, um, this is a, an average of temperatures, summer temperatures from 81 to 2010. We can see based on the colors across the country that we may be up into the low 30s in Celsius uh, in the warmest areas down to uh, maybe 12.5 uh, in some of the cooler areas. Compare that, uh, well, so looking at this map, most of this area is this yellowish color. And so we're looking at 
20s to maybe maybe low 30s for most most of the uh, country of Spain. The transition zone of the United States, our summer temperatures range from 21 to 27 degrees Celsius. And so again, very similar summer temperatures uh, where I am compared to where you are. Now looking at winter temperatures across Spain, uh, you can see that uh, um, the, the coldest areas there may be around zero Celsius uh, to maybe the uh, 10, maybe 12.5 in, in the warmest areas. Um, and in the, the uh, transition zone, we range from two to seven degrees Celsius in the United States. And so again, it's very similar winter temperatures as, uh, as we have here that, that you have in Spain. And so I think our climates are, are both suited for what I'm going to be talking about uh, today. All right, this is something from, this came off the webpage of the United States Environmental Protection Agency. And basically they're, they're saying that if emissions stay where they are from, the emissions from vehicles stay at the same level that we're at right now, this is what's gonna happen over the next 20, 30 years. And so they're predicting that we're gonna see a 1.7 degrees Celsius increase in temperatures by the middle of the century, and as much as, as 5.6 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. And so graphically, this shows the state of Illinois here, and Chicago is right up here on the lake, so right around this area right here. Chicago will move about 500 kilometers south to where we live in Kentucky. And so the, the climate of, of Illinois will then become one of growing a lot of warm season grasses, whereas now they grow mostly cool season grasses. By the end of century, under the lower emissions uh, scenario, they're looking at uh, you know much, much hotter again, a few more hundred uh, kilometers farther south if we continue at the same trend that we're at today. And so again, we're getting warmer. It's, uh, it's, it's looking more and more like we should be growing more Bermuda grass as we have this global warming situation going on. And so there's a lot of reasons to love Bermuda grass. It's, it's a great grass for fairways and athletic fields because it, it, can, it can be used in, in so many different uh, situations and, and just because it's tough. So a few things about Bermuda grass fairways on its own. Uh, it likes late spring, summer conditions because it likes the heat. It doesn't like the colder times of the year, obviously, uh, it's it's much more adapted to the the warmer warmer times of the year. Uh, it's it establishes very quickly uh, and recovers very quickly because of these large stolons and rhizomes that spread out vigorously from the mother plants. And so things like par three tee boxes, practice facilities, athletic fields, landing areas on fairways that get beat up, places like that can recover pretty quickly because this grass is so aggressive. Uh, it has really good wear tolerance, and so will take a lot of traffic before it thins out. Uh, likes the heat. I've seen it grow uh, well up into the mid-40s Celsius, and it does uh, just fine in temperatures like that. And it's very deep-rooted, as you can see in this image right here. Roots growing uh, with this grass being mowed at uh, 1.2 centimeters. We still have, oops, excuse me, roots that are uh, uh, quite, quite deep. Um, so not a whole lot of water needed for keeping Bermuda grass happy. Also, we don't have a whole lot of insects or disease issues with Bermuda grass, and that's great for us because it's just less headaches for managing. Uh, it's competitive against weeds because it is such a dense canopy and grows so quickly that uh, it, it tends to keep some weeds out compared to other grasses. Uh, we can mow it for, for fairway uses fairly lowly or fairly uh, short. Uh, 1.2 centimeters is up to uh, over uh, uh, two and a half centimeters or even higher, uh, depending on what we're looking for for our fairways. And the density is great. And that's one of the reasons why we see the, the good uh, uh, weed control naturally from this grass. This is a golf course in New Jersey. And New Jersey is a good bit north of us. Uh, it's on the East Coast but I would not consider it the transition zone. I would call this the Northeastern United States. Uh, but because of our climate shifting, people up in the Northeast are considering Bermuda grass. And so this is a practice facility on a golf course. And you can see they planted Bermuda grass on this tee box 
and the divots from from people practicing the grass gets pretty uh, torn up the same area two weeks later and you can see how much recovery has has gone on uh, on that Bermuda grass tee now think about this if it was the fall we wouldn't have near that much recovery because the Bermuda grass is slowing down at that time of the year and so I don't expect that we would see this much grass uh, during the fall but in midsummer when the Bermuda grass is growing vigorously it does excellent some of the bad things about uh, Bermuda grass though uh, it needs full sun this is a grass that just needs a lot of light to be able to do what it needs to do and so eight hours or so of, of light a day is is what it needs uh, it will go dormant in the winter time we'll see uh, things like this uh, golf course on the bottom right uh, where it's it's brown, it doesn't look very good. We will overseed with ryegrass a lot of times on Bermuda grass athletic, athletic fields and golf courses to give us some color and give us some recovery, uh, but that's not necessarily a good agronomic practice. On very cold winters, we see this quite often in Kentucky. Every every six, seven, eight years, we'll get winter kill where the Bermuda grass actually dies and we have to reseed it or replant it depending on what kind of grass it is. Uh, it's invasive. You can see it moving onto putting greens, uh, into flower beds, uh, pretty much anywhere maybe you don't want to see it. It can grow there because of these the vigorous stones and rhizomes. It likes to be fertilized. It, it has a high end requirement. And so usually we think about uh, applying 48.8 or 50 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen uh, per growing month. So quite a bit. Uh, and then it grows quickly. And so we're mowing quite a bit, quite often. And the wear and tear on your equipment will be higher with this grass because it's tougher to cut. So it's gonna dull blade, uh, real blades quicker, uh, but because of how quickly it, it mows, we're mowing more often. Um, spring dead spot, this disease here that you see is uh, a common issue that we see in the spring and uh, very unsightly and usually by midsummer this is has recovered but uh, for a couple of months each spring looks looks pretty badly and then the last thing that i don't like about bermuda grass is we just it just doesn't stripe like other grasses we can't put down pretty stripes by a, from a mower uh to make it look good on our fairways or wherever we're growing it and so that's just another one of the things i don't like about bermuda grass bluegrass has a lot of good things going for it so um, it's really good color compared to Bermuda grass and even a lot of other uh, other grasses has a nice dark color to it uh, and just really makes it stand out. Uh, it likes growing in the spring and the fall. Those are the times that it's most adapted to and uh, does quite well uh, during those times. Texture is good, fine textured plant um, and it's a soft bladed plant so it, it doesn't beat up mowers quite as much as Bermuda grass does because it is soft. Uh, has rhizomes. They're not of, not as aggressive as the Bermuda grass rhizomes, but still a good way to for this plant to recover. It's very cold tolerant. This was the grass that we had throughout uh, the area of Canada that I grew up in, and so if it survives winters in Canada, you know that it's a cold tolerant plant. Uh, good drought tolerance in that it will shut itself down. It goes dormant when it uh, when it gets too hot and dry. And so it just sleeps those periods out and just waits for the rain to start again. And so it may look ugly, but it's it's uh, it's still it's still alive. Uh, the new varieties of bluegrasses, we can mow them quite short, uh, as short as a half inch or 1.2 centimeters. Uh, so quite quite short for bluegrasses, and they seem to be doing just fine with that. And then as you can see up here, one of the things I really like about bluegrass is the aesthetics of it. It's just a really pretty grass that stripes easily. Some of the things I don't like about bluegrass is uh, the traffic tolerance. It doesn't take much traffic, but again, remember that we have the rhizomes and so we do get some recovery from it. Heat tolerance is poor. Uh, it doesn't do all that well in our summers. And so Kentucky's um, nickname is the bluegrass state. It's probably not a good nickname for our state because bluegrass tends to struggle with our hot summers and can get diseased and, and thinned out with the, with our with our hot summers. Uh, very shallow rooted, uh, and so dealing with drought, it, it like I said, it just goes dormant. It doesn't send down deeper roots to stay green and growing like some other grasses will do. It just uh, has those short, shallow roots and will will go dormant. Um, doesn't do well in the shade, just like Bermuda grass. 
likes to be fertilized, not as much as Bermuda grass, but still needs quite a bit of nitrogen to, to do well. And then all sorts of pest problems. Our biggest one that we've got in, in Kentucky is this summer patch disease. We see this show up in hot and humid uh, conditions. You've probably seen something like this before, just seasonal growth charts for cool season and warm season grasses. Uh, and the top one there are cool season grasses. You, they don't grow a whole lot in the wintertime, but will grow a little bit. But as the temperatures climb in the spring, so does the growth rate. The, the growth rate just thriving, doing quite well in the spring. And then as we get into summer, the growth rate really drops off and we, we, uh, we don't see a whole lot of root growth or shoot growth during the summertime. In the fall, growth picks up back up again and does pretty well. Our warm season grasses are the opposite of that. No growth, they're dormant in the wintertime, pick up in the spring, are thriving during the summertime, slow down in the fall, and then dormant again in the wintertime. And so this is what we have in the transition zone. Uh, we've got our cool season grasses that don't grow at all or are not gonna recover in the summertime. And then we've got our warm season grasses that will recover then, but don't recover in the spring, fall, or winter. And so we don't have a perfect situation with the grasses that we have. Ideally, this is what we'd have, our cool season grass thriving in the spring, something else, a warm season grass then coming on in the summertime and thriving while the cool season grass is not. And then as it slows down, the cool season grass picking back up again in the fall. That's what we would like to see. So let's look at the history of Blue Muda here. Um, I, this is not my idea. I'm just uh, jumped on the bandwagon of it because it was something that looked really interesting to me. And so I've, I've done probably most of the research on this in, in probably the world at this point. Um, so way back in 1953, uh, scientists in Southern California way down here in the Los Angeles area, they started looking at mixtures of Bermuda grass with cool season grasses, and they stated in an old publication, mixtures of cool season grasses with Bermuda grass show promise for year-round lawns resistant to weeds. Very interesting, but it didn't go anywhere. People in California or the Western US didn't start growing warm season grasses and cool season grasses together, it just didn't happen. Fast forward 20 years and scientists in Maryland on the other side of the country over here started looking at the same thing. They found that Bermuda grass goes brown in the winter, which we know and Kentucky bluegrass deteriorates during the summer, but growing them together can overcome their individual weaknesses. Good idea, but it didn't take off again. And much of this is probably due to the grasses that they had available to them 40 years ago. They didn't have really good Bermuda grasses and they didn't have really good blue grasses at that time. And so these ideas, although good, they just didn't take off because of the grasses that were available to them. Now move uh, 30 years uh, into the future from, uh, from the scientists in Maryland and a seeds person from Kentucky was actually traveling through Europe and uh, visiting grass production facilities all through Europe and he found this field in Northern Italy. And if you know anything about Bermuda grass for sod production, you know that it doesn't lift very well. It doesn't want to be harvested. It tends to fall apart. Even though it has big stones and rhizomes, it doesn't like to be harvested. And so what these sod producers were doing was mixing in some bluegrass to help hold it together. We see this with tall fescue sod as well, very common to mix bluegrass in to help hold it together but they did this with Bermuda grass. And he found this field and thought, you know, this is something that I could take back to Kentucky with me potentially, and people growing grass in the transition zone may be able to use this. So he came back, wrote an article, his name was Roger Crenshaw. He wrote an article about bluegrass and Bermuda grass together. This gentleman, his name is Brian Winka. He lives in St. Louis, Missouri, which is also in the transition zone. And he saw this article from the seeds person, Roger, and thought, you know, this is something that may work. He's, this guy was a sports turf manager growing cool season and warm season grasses and had the issues of everybody else in the transition zone. His Bermuda grass fields would struggle in the wintertime. He couldn't get a whole lot of wear on them. His cool season fields would struggle in the summertime. He couldn't get a whole lot of wear on them. What could he do? He saw this article and talked to Roger about, you know, is this something that I could try that may would work for my situation here in St. Louis. 
the same time, he visited a golf course in, in southern Missouri, south of where he lives, and found a Bermuda grass golf course where they were trying out some new grasses. They tried HGT bluegrass, which was a pretty new grass at that time, a persistent perennial ryegrass, and a new creeping bent grass as an overseed or an interseed to, to live with the Bermuda grass. And obviously, as you can tell from this image, the, the bent grass is struggling during the summertime. The ryegrass looks absolutely horrible, but this bluegrass looks pretty good. So a couple of things to keep in mind here as I talk about this early on process. The seeds person that went over to Northern Europe and saw the, the bluegrass and the Bermuda grass growing together worked for the company Barenbrook. And so when he recommended a grass to Brian in St. Louis, he recommended HGT bluegrass. Also, Brian saw this HGT bluegrass growing in Southern Missouri and thought that it looked pretty interesting. And so the early start of this process was all with HGT bluegrass. And we'll talk about how that may change over time, but early on, uh, everything being planted was HGT. And as Brian got into this and, and started researching this particular bluegrass, he found that it germinated quickly. Um, it grew in pretty quickly. It was pretty aggressive. It took, uh, it takes some traffic. It, uh, it's better than most bluegrasses in terms of its traffic tolerance. It will recover potentially quicker because it's more aggressive than other bluegrasses. Summer patch resistance, that disease summer patch, if we can't, don't get it as much, that's, that's obviously a good, good thing to, uh, to see. Uh, greens up earlier in the spring. And so it gets growing earlier than uh, some other older bluegrasses doesn't produce much thatch. And obviously that's a good thing. We don't want to see too much thatch and bluegrass is a thatch producer. Uh, as he saw in this picture here and when he visited this golf course, that it seemed to be fairly competitive with Bermuda grass. And so he thought, you know, is this maybe the thing that I'm looking for to solve my problems in the transition zone where I can't use my Bermuda grass fields in the wintertime and I can't use my cool season fields in the summertime maybe growing these things together is the answer. But the problem is, if I can get to my next slide here, there we go. Um, there's just, nobody has done this before. How do I do it? And so his initial thoughts on it were, will the two grasses be compatible together? Will one grass really dominate over the other? For instance, will the bluegrass shade out the, the Bermuda grass and we won't see any of the Bermuda grass over time, which is frequently what we see with ryegrass. If ryegrass is left in uh, for long term, we see less and less Bermuda grass over years. And so would that happen with bluegrass? We didn't know. He didn't know. Uh, what about persistence? Will one eventually uh, just go away and, and it'll become, like I just said, uh, more of one or the other? Uh, how will they look together? Will the quality of the grass be we be pretty? Uh, will it look uniform or will it look clumpy like we see with ryegrass that's kept around oftentimes in the summertime? And then maintenance. What, when do you do maintenance? When can you fertilize? When can you aerify? Uh, those are all questions that we didn't have any answers to early on. And then what about uh, year to year weather? If it gets really hot, does the bluegrass die out completely? If it gets really cold, does the Bermuda grass die out? And then what? And so these are all things we didn't know about. Um, and then interceding more bluegrass, uh, do you do that? Do you, which do you use the same grass that you used before? Do you use high rates, low rates? When do you do it, spring or fall? We didn't have any of these answers early on. And so uh, he was just trying things to see what would work for him in, in St. Louis. And so in May in 2013, he decided, I'm going to try this. So he got some, some grass seed. He took his phrase mower out and he stripped the surface off of his Bermuda grass, planted, he, he planted uh, this turf blue HGT uh, at 107 kilograms per hectare. And he did one field uh, where he seeded in one direction and he did another field where he seeded in two directions. And then he top, top dressed one field at 0.64 centimeters of sand over top of the seed and another one at 1.3 centimeters over top of the seed. And so fairly heavy top dressing on top of, uh, of the seed. But this is what he saw five days after planting, he was already seeing germination, which is phenomenal for bluegrass. But bluegrass is typically slow to come out of the ground. 
and slow to establish. And so pretty exciting to see uh, germination and establishment coming on that quickly. So this was May 2013. Fast forward to April 2014, and you can see how good that bluegrass looks. The Bermuda grass is supposedly underneath it here, but it's dormant. And all you can see is the bluegrass looking pretty good on this on this field. He was absolutely uh, happy with with how this did for him because he was able to use this this field not only in the summertime but in the fall and the winter time that he typically in, in years past wasn't able to do that. But his concern at this point was with this much bluegrass, how much Bermuda grass do I have in this stand? And so he got his phrase mower back out and he stripped off what was there and just let whatever come back uh, that was in the soil come back. And you can see in here, this is mostly Bermuda grass that is coming back. And so he was pretty happy with the fact that I've got a great stand of bluegrass, but I have Bermuda grass underneath it here that is starting to come back uh, a year later. And so that's where he started with this process. About that same time, this was my experience in Kentucky. This is a Bermuda grass variety trial where I'm looking at a bunch of different Bermuda grasses to see how well they do growing in the transition zone. And as you can see, this is an overhead shot. We've got, this is where I put traffic down in just straight lines. Wherever I put traffic down, we've got 100% winter kill. The light coming in here is, is winter weeds, but uh, the dark green here, um, is Bermuda grass greening up? Any brown areas is just winter kill. Over on this side, this is winter kill on this plot, winter kill over here. Uh, we just had a lot of dead grass because we had a couple of really cold winters in, in a row. And so, you know, I like Bermuda grass. I, I like to see people using it because of its strengths, but because of situations like this, it's hard to recommend it all of the time because if somebody loses their grass, then you know they're they're left with well what do I do how do I regrass this how do I get the, the the fairways ready to play on and so that winter I was speaking at a national sports turf managers meeting and at the end of my meeting uh, after after I was done speaking this this uh, sports turf manager Brian from St Louis came up to me and he said what do you think about growing Kentucky bluegrass with Bermuda grass all the time and I, I told him just bluntly I think it's a dumb idea you know and and it wasn't being mean but I just wanted to be honest with him I don't think it's a good idea and he said well drive out to St. Louis come and look at my facility and then make up your mind so I did that I that spring I drove out to uh, St. Louis I looked at his his facility and his fields were remarkable I was there in the spring the bluegrass was doing fine the Bermuda grass was coming on and was blown away at how good these fields looked. And so that was uh, in 20, spring of 2015, and that was my first taste of, of Blue Muda. And so by that fall, I had planted it and started to play around with how do you do this? What, what how do you plant it? Um, how do you fertilize it? And that was my first study was, different seeding rates and different fertilizer rates and sources. And as you can see here uh, in this image, we've got three different fertilizers that we use, just straight urea, just uh, soluble nitrogen, a polymer coated urea, uh, and so slow release fertilizer, and then no fertilizer whatsoever. And so a couple of months after uh, fertilizing, three months after planting, you can see how good this polymer coated urea does uh, compared to no fertilizer whatsoever um, or even their urea. And so with this study, we were looking at the seeding rates um, and, and I'll mention them here in a minute. Uh, we were looking at perennial ryegrass versus Kentucky bluegrass to see, you know, long term was there differences between these grasses. We used a vertical mower for some of the plant uh, plots to uh, to get the bluegrass established and uh, we just drop seeded some others where we didn't do any preparation whatsoever, just drop the seed into the, the plots and then and drag them in afterwards. And then, as I mentioned, the, the fertilizer source there. Now, fast forward to the, the next summer. This is June 28th, so eight months after we planted. Overhead shot, you can see that these are browning out a little bit. We had a pretty hot summer. 
But looking at that, that polymer coated urea, that strip of dark green right down through the middle of all of those plots looks pretty good. Even middle of the summertime, no other fertilizer was put down. These numbers that you see across the bottom here uh, are the, the rates of seed that we went out with at uh, 122 kilograms per hectare or 244 kilograms per hectare. And VM is vertical mowing, um, where we went in to vertical mow these plots and then seeded into them versus we just drop seeded these ones. And we found the vertical mowing helped some, uh, but the seeding rates didn't really matter all that much. Uh, and so we, we thought, of course, the low seeding rates is, is better because it's going to save significant money over the high seeding rates. And so, like I said early on, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I neglected these. I didn't do anything whatsoever other than the initial fertilizer that they got. These didn't get any irrigation whatsoever. And so that's why you're seeing the browning out in the middle of the summertime. This is a Bermuda alone plot right here. Uh, compared to what we're seeing, the darker colors of the bluegrasses around there. Um, but this is, again, this is uh, late June, and uh, the plants are starting to struggle a little bit. I didn't put any any irrigation on them whatsoever that year, and jump forward another few months to December, and this is what the plots looked like. I'm not exactly thrilled with how much grass is left on these. You can see these strips right here where a traffic machine, a traffic simulator was used to beat up the plots to see if the bluegrass helped at all. But with this little bit of bluegrass that you can see in these plots, it's not that much. It's not that much cover to really give a whole lot of recovery from. And so I was I was thinking, well, this, this looked okay in the summertime, looked good last fall, but this year it doesn't look all that good. Well, it didn't occur to me that neglecting these plots not irrigating them would result in them looking this bad. And so uh, what we found over time is you can't just neglect them completely or else the, the, the bluegrass will struggle coming back in the fall. Um, but we don't necessarily need to uh, water them all the time and keep them uh, extremely wet, just enough to keep the plants uh, uh, growing at some, some, uh, some level. Move forward now into April. And again, I, haven't, I didn't fertilize these things. I didn't water them. I, I trafficked them. And this is all annual bluegrass coming up on straight Bermuda plots. But the bluegrass that I had put down a year and a half ago is coming back nicely. And so again, after I, me not doing anything, I was really excited to see how much bluegrass was coming back that April and was really excited to see uh, uh, how good these things looked after me just mismanaging them. And then move forward into that next summer and you can see this is all bluegrass coming back and doing quite well even still with no fertilizer or anything applied to them compared to the bermuda grass alone and you can see the darker color from the bluegrass added to the the uh, bermuda grass um, and so we've learned a lot from this first experience experiment and moving forward and i'll, I'll walk you through some of the things that uh, that we've done so the first thing, as I mentioned, HGT bluegrass was the only one being used. And this study is HGT. And I still have this study in the ground. We've done all sorts of different uh, things to it over the years, including growing it for, for horse tracks, for horses to run on it, and all sorts of different things. But uh, this initial stand that I planted looks better today than it did even in this picture in, in uh, one year after being planted or a year and a half after being planted. Um, and so we were only using HGT bluegrass up until this point. And again, there, it was fine. It seemed to be doing okay. But I had another seed company come to me and say, is HGT the only one that you can use? And I said, well, I don't know. It's the only one we've used thus far. And they said, well, we'd like to do an experiment where you compare other grasses, some of our grasses to HGT to tell us will it do as well as as hgt and so that's exactly what we do we, we we set up a study to compare hgt to 10 other bluegrasses to see what happens is is that the only grass that works for this or are there other bluegrasses that'll work for this and to really torture these plants if you've not seen one of these traffic simulators in, in action before they're pretty aggressive and i'll show you how this thing works here if i can here we go get it going
so those drums that are rolling along are are on a chain and they've got uh they're they're both turning at different speeds and so they tend to rip and tear as they're going through the grass and this machine was developed to provide as many cleat marks in the grass all of these cleat marks right here all the little dimples as would be at the midfield on an NFL football field after a game. And so what we found is going one pass down and one pass back is the exact same amount of cleat marks that you would find on a uh, professional football field after a game. And so pretty good amount of damage that we can get from that machine. And here it is early on, we were trafficking these plots uh, three times a week. And so three games a week that we were putting on. So quite a bit of, of, of traffic to see what would happen with the bluegrass and the Bermuda grass. And so early on, you can see the damage that we're seeing uh, tearing the grass up, but not too bad yet. And then much later on, you can see how excessive that it can get by using this thing over time. And we did this for uh, two and a half months, three times a week. And so with Bermuda grass only, you can see a little bit of annual bluegrass in there but you can see very little Bermuda grass in these plots compared to on either side where we've got blue muda, bluegrass and Bermuda growing together, much more green in these areas. So what we found from this research was that uh, blue muda, bluegrass and Bermuda grass together will, will uh, take about 10% more traffic than Bermuda grass only. And Bermuda grass is a very traffic tolerant plant and so we're, we're increasing the, the traffic tolerance even more. 10% is not that great, but the thing that you don't see in this plot right here is that this is the cool time of the year. This is just gonna continue to shut down and go dormant. This is going to start to thrive. And so the things that we noticed that were the most interesting from this study was that the blue muda plots um, in the spring had 100% cover whereas these trafficked Bermuda grass only plots had about 40 to 50% cover in the spring before they started growing for the summer. And so recovery wise year round, that's where we're seeing the benefit of it. We've got a grass that will recover in the wintertime and a grass that will recover in the summertime. The other thing we found from this summer, or excuse me, from this, from this project is that uh, the bluegrass variety there wasn't just one that worked. There are several that work just fine for using for for blue, blue, excuse me, blue muda. All right, so we finished that trial up. This is another one that I've got in the ground currently. This is a study that I planted last fall, and I put a, a uh, email out to all the different seed companies, and I said, uh, you know, if you'd like to be a part of this study, just send me your material and we'll plant it. I've got 59 different grasses grown in this study and uh, over one Bermuda grass and replicated three times. So uh, 100 and, 180 plants or 180, whatever it is, plots in this in this trial. Um, so a lot of a lot of plots, a lot of rating that goes on with this. Early on, we can see differences in germination and early establishment. This is after only a couple of weeks after planting. I've still got strings down uh, to keep plots separated. And then move forward. And in February, late February, we're still in winter in Kentucky. And you can see how much establishment I'd had in the fall. And so we, these have not started to wake up and started to grow yet uh, as they would in the spring. Um, but this is how much cover we got in in the fall compared to this is Bermuda grass alone here and here and over here as well with some POA coming in it. And so pretty good amount of cover over most of those plots the first fall. Move forward another month and usually by mid-March we are we are our cool season grasses are growing vigorously by that point. We had a very cold and wet spring this year and things didn't take off like I would like to, to see them. You can see we greened up some but not uh, most of the plots still look pretty brown, not all that great. And so not not fantastic at that point, but we finally did get warm in May and we started putting the traffic machine on the plots. And so what you're seeing in this picture, all of these straight lines up and down this picture are the traffic machine that you saw that's just beating these plots up day after day after day. And so for the month of May, we did three traffic events per week on these plots to see how would they recover.
And so looking closely at these to see are there differences in bluegrasses, look at this one where we have quite a bit of damage on the side of the plot that, uh, that got traffic on it versus the other side that didn't get traffic. And this plot over here got traffic over this side, but there's very little wear showing. And I don't know which two grasses these are off the top of my head, but for this part of this study, they, this one looks pretty, pretty good versus this one doesn't look as good. And here's Bermuda grass alone as a comparison. Uh, showing that it does thin out uh, with the traffic, but uh, and the color-wise, it's not as green of color as the Bermuda plots. All right, we also trafficked during the month of July this year, and these this is the same study, and I wanted to show you how these plots look and how they recover two weeks after getting traffic on them um, in late summer. And so the bluegrass is still there where you can see this is Bermuda grass alone on the right side of the screen versus blue muda. Both of these plots are darker green than the Bermuda alone. And uh, both of them look pretty good. You can see the traffic side was this side for both of them. Uh, both of them are recovering. You can see the, the Bermuda grass and bluegrass in these plots. You can also see these brown marks in the plots and that's another thing i'll show you here in a second that we were doing to to measure how good these plots will do now i show you these two plots specifically compared to the bermuda grass alone because these are the two most popular blends that people are using for this blue muda concept in the united states i'm not saying they're better than everybody else or anything like that i'm just saying they're the most popular and one of the reasons behind this is both of these companies are advertising, advertising aggressively to get their information out um, to, to get people that are interested in Blue Muda to plant this. And so Mountain View with their Blue Muda 365 SS here on the left and Baron Brug with their perfectly suited for Blue Muda here ad on the right. And again, I don't say, I'm not saying neither one of these is the best. I'm just saying these are the ones that are, are being used uh, quite frequently. Here's this machine that, that produced those brown marks on the turf. This is a shear tester. A little blade goes into the ground and basically it measures how hard or how easy this grass is to divot. And you can see it will kick out that divot here. And so the brown marks that you're seeing was we replaced these divots and in, in as they recover. This machine over here is a rotational resistance machine. And so how this works is it's got cleats on the bottom of it and just like with uh, somebody playing soccer or, or some other sport on grass as they plant their foot and turn their foot to pivot and change directions uh, this tells us how hard that that grass is to break the cleats how hard it is for the, the cleats to turn in the grass and so we want some resistance so you can turn directions and go the other way quickly but we want the plants to give so that players don't get lower uh, body injuries very easily. A couple other here that I wanted to point out, uh, these are experimental grasses. I don't know if they'll be released or not, but in this trial, these grasses, from, both from Columbia River Seeds, look excellent. You can see the color differences based or compared to the Bermuda grass alone there, but uh, both look really good in this trial. Again, I don't, I don't know if they'll be released, if that company wants to move forward with them or not, but in, in this trial, I'm, I'm quite happy with them. Those are both bluegrasses. The interesting thing about this trial is that I've also got fescues in there. And surprisingly, uh, these tall fescues look quite good. Um, and so I'd never considered them as an option before because usually we need to, to mow um, the uh, fescue is a lot taller than bluegrass. I would never consider these are mown at 1.9 centimeters. I would think that uh, five centimeters or more is more suitable for fescues, but some of these new fescues will tolerate this low mowing height and have genetically built in better heat tolerance than bluegrass has. And so these fescues look pretty exciting and may be a possibility for uh, future testing and, and use uh, for this, this concept. I get this question quite often, so what's the best bluegrass? And I don't work for any of these seed companies, and so I don't tell people brand A or brand B. That's not my job. My job is to, to determine is there kinds that do better than others. And so looking at this, this picture on the left here, this is just an, a uh, bluegrass 
uh, cultivar trial. And you can see, this is one I just took last week, and we've still got some st summer stress showing up on here, but with, there's all sorts of different colors for different bluegrasses. And usually these colors coincide with some kind of family. Bluegrasses are all broken down into a bunch of different families and they have different characteristics. And from what I've seen thus far, these four families, Compact America, Shamrock, Julia, and Eurasian families, tend to look better than, than grasses in other bluegrass families. Um, and so you can go and specifically look these up to see what kind of Eurasian grass might be available from whichever company you want to do business from, uh, uh, or a Julia, or a Shamrock, or a Compact America, to see you know, what, what's available to me, um, and again, I'm, my job is not to push any brands on you. I just want to uh, tell you what's been working for us. I also get the question, is there any that I shouldn't plant? And the answer is yes, there is some. Specifically, the midnight types. Uh, this is a midnight type growing. And you can see this is all Bermuda grass, the lighter green. And the dark green, you can see, is clumps of this midnight type bluegrass. Um, it doesn't do very well in this mix. It tends to segregate. We see just patches of the dark dark green in there versus the Bermuda, Bermuda grass growing throughout that entire plot. And so we found definitively at this point that the midnight types of bluegrasses don't do very well for this mix in our, in our uh, climate. All right, I'll wrap this up with a little bit of maintenance uh, from, from what we've found over the years of, of doing things. And, and one of the most important things is to start off with good material. Uh, your Bermuda grass base, get the best Bermuda grass that you can possibly get, uh, a good cold tolerant one that, that suits your climate, and then also find a bluegrass that is one of the newer ones, more, uh, more aggressive than some of the older ones, and again, preferably in one of those four families that I just mentioned. And then seeding at a rate of 122 kilograms per hectare uh, is the rate that we found that works the best for this process. And then we want to see good seed soil contact. These are two studies that I've got out right now. The one on the right here, I vertical mowed prior to planting. This one on the left here, I didn't do anything. I just seeded straight into this. You can see how dense that canopy is. This is latitude 36 per meter grass, extremely dense uh, and hard to get bluegrass down through that canopy. And uh, we, we swept the, the seed uh, to try and get it down in there a little bit. Over here, this is Riviera Bermuda grass, more of an open canopy, but we also vertical mode it, and you can see that it's a more open, easier to get seed down in there than the grass on the left. And so doing whatever you can to get the good seed soil contact, whether vertical mowing or using one of these machines that uh, will help to uh, drill the seed into the soil and get that good seed soil contact, you know, that's what we want to do to, to make this work for us. And so we're not wasting seed and not wasting our time. Also with establishment, so this is a slower process that if you've been overseeding with ryegrass in years past, it uh, takes quite a bit longer to, to get established than ryegrass does. Uh, and so don't think about ryegrass when you're doing this, it's gonna take a, a bunch more time as you've seen with some of the pictures that I put out. So drilling is my, my um, ideal situation for planting. Vertical mowing is, works okay and then broadcasting if you can't vertical mow or drill the seed into the ground to get that good seed soil contact is, is my least uh, favorite choice. Late summer planting, so before it starts to cool off in the, in the fall, that's the time of the year that seems to be the way to go with planting because we got more time in the fall for the bluegrass to come on and start to develop and grow and fill in than if we're planting late. And so we can get a, a, a stand established quicker if we're planting uh, earlier in the fall. And then prepping seed, if we can scarify it or pre-germination, anything like that, anything you can do to get this, speed this process up is obviously a good thing. This picture in the top right here, uh, this was uh, drilled in into the ground in October of 2016. This is one month after you can see the grass coming up in stripes a month later. And it doesn't look all that great, but the Bermuda grass probably had been a frost on here by this point and starting to shut down but some bluegrass in there, but still not great. Fast forward to that next winter, and that's the same field, and how good the bluegrass is doing on that same field that was just drilled in. And so warmer temperatures in this, in this year 
uh, resulted in really good bluegrass establishment intake. And you can see how good this field looks with the Bermuda grass dormant in this situation, but the bluegrass growing over top. With fertility, um, what we found from this is that uh, if you think only about fertilizing for the Bermuda grass and fertilize only during the summertime, you'll probably lose the, the bluegrass. It, uh, if it gets overstimulated or even cooked from the, the fertilizer in the summertime, you'll probably lose that bluegrass. One of our uh, sports facilities in the state did that and lost their bluegrass one summer early on. Uh, most of the nitrogen can go out in the, in the fall. What we found is 98 to 196 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen uh, are pretty good rates to, to keep both grasses happy. Um, by putting out uh, higher rates the first, the first fall of planting, we can get quicker germination and establishment if we're compared to not uh, uh, fertilizing at all. Um, and so I'll show you a picture of that here just in a second. And then foliar wraps during the summertime uh, can help you. Uh, I like slow release uses though, because then we're feeding the bluegrass and the Bermuda grass with, with one shot and we don't have to get in there and do these foliar wraps. But uh, you know, people have, have come up with different things, uh, what works best for them. But, uh, but for us, what we've found is these slow release fertilizer apps do pretty well. Uh, the picture on the left here is what, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the first high, higher nitrogen for fertility the first fall. Um, the dark green here is where we've got higher rates in the light, light green areas where we either didn't fertilize or used much lower rates of nitrogen the first fall. We get much more bluegrass coming on where we fertilized heavier, two or three pounds, um, uh, 100 kilograms per hectare to 130-ish uh, uh, kilograms per hectare in these, in these dark green plots. And so we've been pretty happy with what we're seeing with the higher fertility levels in the, in the first fall. Um, mowing cultural practices, uh, there are some people mowing it down to 1.2, 1.3 centimeters. And then we've, we've been successful growing this up to 12 centimeters without any issues whatsoever. Both grasses look great together at both heights. Don't have any problems whatsoever. Mowing patterns, that's one of the big benefits that I've seen from this over Bermuda grass alone. We get to stripe these fields now, these fairways now, whereas we didn't in the past uh, with straight, straight Bermuda grass. Airification, uh, what we found with that is you want to airify when both grasses are growing. So late spring, uh, while the bluegrass is still doing fine, but the Bermuda grass is growing, so both grasses can recover. Uh, and then vertical mowing, if you can, just to thin out and gain, stimulate growth. Again, we, we got to be careful with this. We don't want to do this in the heat of the summer and really uh, hurt the bluegrass. But uh, times of the year where, it's, where both grasses are growing some might be better than, uh, than in extreme times of the year. And then chemical wise, uh, we were, Xavier and I were talking beforehand and, and not a whole lot of chemical use in, in Europe, which I think is fantastic. And one of the things that I like about Blue Muda, especially for situations where chemical use is, is limited, is that we don't need a whole lot to keep these, these fairways looking really pretty. So most people here are using plant growth regulators. I don't know how much PGR use is used in Europe or, or not, uh, but uh, Trinexpec ethyl being, is fairly commonly used. Uh, in the U.S. on Blue Muda, uh, I have not used any whatsoever and have been happy with how my, my grasses look. Uh, Fungicide-wise, uh, typically with bluegrass alone, we would get summer patch or other summer diseases and would need to apply fungicides to, to deal with those issues. Um, but what we found is because the Bermuda grass is mixed in between the blades of the bluegrass, we don't see the uh, disease is really taking off like we did with, with bluegrass alone. And so we have not sprayed any fungicides, period, since starting this five years ago. And then weed control wise, annual bluegrass is the question that I get the most about. Uh, how do you keep POA out of this? Because how, you, how do you spray it out or what do you do? Well, the first, the first fall, you'll probably have some come in and then it's going to die out uh, as we get into the heat of the summer in, in the, the next year. And then the bluegrass and Bermuda grass together is so thick that we don't see annual bluegrass problems in consecutive years. And so that's one of the really big benefits we've seen from this, this uh, process. 
We use pre-emerge herbicides, but I think you can get away without using them uh, if they're not available to you. And then uh, post-emerge grass weed control, uh, really not an option for us because there's not a chemical that you can use on cool season grasses and on warm season grasses together. The chemicals that we have available will injure one or the other. And so we're just stuck with, with, with no weed control. But like I said, these are so dense of canopies that it's not really a problem for us. This is the uh, first golf course in Kentucky that tried it. They only tried it on half of a fairway because they were nervous about how good it would look. And so this was early on the first summer. Doesn't look all that great in this picture, but you can see right across the middle there how the bluegrass with the Bermuda looks compared to Bermuda grass alone. And so as the year went on, this is moving into the fall. You can see they're blowing out their, their, their irrigation system for the winter. The bluegrass looking pretty good versus an area where they didn't see the bluegrass, the, the dormant Bermuda grass. And so people started golfing that course and were wondering, well, why is this one area look so good? The next year, it looked extremely good. And he was striping these fairways up that had never striped before. And more and more of the golfers that were playing this course said, this looks great, what are you doing? And so he jumped in and decided to go all in with Blue Muda across this entire course. And all of his fairways look like this now, which looks pretty fantastic compared to no striping whatsoever of, of what he would have had in the past with Bermuda grass alone. Another interesting thing they found with this golf course is that the number of rounds are up tremendously because people find it a prettier golf course to play now than they did before. It's worth more value to the people that are playing it. And so they're, they're, they're getting more rounds and their revenue is up at this golf course. They've also kept in this one fairway where they only did half of it, just as a reminder from where they've been. And you can see that Blue Muda going up the hill looks great versus the Bermuda grass, an old uh, junky variety of Bermuda grass uh, down here that didn't look good at all. You can see the, the aesthetic benefit of this, this two grass system together. Cost wise, if you're already overseeding um, ryegrass into Bermuda grass, then you probably won't have much change uh, to your cost whatsoever. If you don't overseed, then obviously you're going to have the initial cost of the bluegrass seed alone. But uh, looking at the differences in cost between perennial ryegrass, which is pretty cheap per pound, $1.25 to $1.45 per pound, we seed at 10 pounds at a lower rate. Um, that gives us uh, $12.50 to $14.50 per thousand square feet. Um, with Kentucky bluegrass, much more expensive seed, but because we have such a lower rate, that we're putting it down at, we come up with about the same cost as we do ryegrass. We also don't need to do anything in the spring to get rid of it as we would with ryegrass because we want it to be there year round. And so cost wise, not that much of a, a initial cost uh, and a little bit of seed maybe put down on high traffic areas, uh, three part three tee box practice areas to, uh, to get it to fill in, but, uh, but uh, not a whole lot of extra seed put out year after year. So really quickly to wrap up, things that I've noticed from this during my five years of, of working with it, <coughs> excuse me, the color year round is remarkable. Better color in the summertime, better color in the wintertime. It's just much prettier stand. Traffic tolerance is better with, with uh, Blue Muda than it is with Bermuda grass alone or bluegrass alone. Uh, recovery time any time of the year, because we've got two grasses that will spread from rhizomes, uh, we get recovery any time of the year, basically, as long as they're growing. Uh, spring cover is a big difference with the Blue Muda system versus Bermuda grass alone. The grasses are thick and growing in the spring where they're not with Bermuda grass. Density in general, this picture at the top here shows the density and why it, it's so good at keeping weeds out. When it's that thick, it's really hard for another plant to get established in that system. Fungicides, like I talked about, we're not using fungicides really. Uh, striping, that's one of the nice things, just a bonus uh, of this process. And then cheaper than overseeding, especially in the long term, because you're only doing this once, overseeding you're doing typically every year. Now I show this because, you know, it's not necessarily 
just you put it down and forget about it. There's all, always things that we're learning new about it and we, we run into problems and, and we're trying new things all the time. We haven't got all the questions figured out at this point. And so it's not some sort of a magic bullet that uh, you just put it down and, and it's going to solve every problem that you have. But from what I've seen, I'm pretty happy with, with the results of this. Uh, and with that, uh, happy to answer any questions that you might have about uh, anything that we've talked about today. Uh, and if you're uh, curious about what, what we do here at the University of Kentucky, feel free to, uh, to check out our webpage or follow me on Twitter or, or check out our YouTube page. With that, I'm, I'm happy to open it up. Um, okay. Hi, Greg. Thank you very much Hi. for your presentation. It, it, has, it was really interesting. Uh, there is a, a pair of questions, a couple of questions. Uh, just a second. Um, uh, in, in a different growing conditions, like an, in a shady area, in a shady areas with Bermuda or sunny slopes face to south with uh, Kentucky bluegrass, uh what to do with these different growing conditions so in the shady areas um because bermuda grass nor yes. bluegrass they they both will struggle in the shade yes uh it's it's probably not going to solve those those problems but tall fescue like i showed on that one slide has pretty good shade tolerance and so one of those new improved short growing fescues might be a solution for a shaded fairway where the, the, the Bermuda grass is going to struggle, the the, uh, the Kentucky bluegrass will struggle, but the fescue may do just fine in that shade. Uh, south facing slope, um, obviously that's going to favor the Bermuda grass. And so what we've seen in situations like that is that uh, we get a natural natural transition during the different times of the year. So in the summertime, there's much more Bermuda grass than there is bluegrass. In the fall and the spring, there's much more bluegrass than there is Bermuda grass. And so in a south facing, facing slope, what you're going to see is more Bermuda grass typically in the summertime because it's going to be hotter and that bluegrass is going to, is going to go shut down quicker. Um, and that's okay. It just may take a little bit longer to come out in the fall on those hot areas than it does on the other areas of fairways that are maybe not south facing. So areas like that, if it's in very important to keep all the bluegrass coming back at the same time, I would maybe do a little bit of hand watering uh, on those spots to, to keep the bluegrass uh, equal to the rest of the fairway. <clears throat> okay, and um, what's your, your opinion about the, the the relevance of the different kind of variety of, of varieties cultivars so is there are there different ones that i prefer over others uh, no uh, the relevance of of the different cultivars so um, how important are the differences uh, sorry i i read it bad uh, how important is are the differences between the among the the, the varieties cultivars uh Significant. Um, there are some that I've seen planted that haven't worked. They just, they fail. Um, the bluegrass doesn't work well with the Bermuda grass. And so the four families that I showed seem to be the ones that work the best, but uh, uh, there are some um, from very well-known companies that uh, have tried this and have failed. Uh, and so, you know, I'm not saying to use like I said, I'm not don't don't use this brand or that brand necessarily, um, but the two brands that I talked about quite a bit, they seem to be doing pretty well. Um, but like I showed, the the experimental ones that are coming through um, probably look better than than both of the popular ones that are that are being used. And so, um, you know, to answer that question, I would say, don't plant um, midnight type the really extremely dark green bluegrasses, those are the ones that we've seen fail. The other types seem to do okay. And then blends, different types of bluegrasses blended together into one bag. Uh, you can get some of the strengths and weaknesses all mixed together to average out and maybe do better than one variety alone. 
Okay, and an another question, uh, which would be the way to introduce the Blue Muda in a, an established mixture of Poa Ben Turf? Poa Ben Turf. So um, ideally in a situation like that, you would um, convert to Bermuda grass first, get the Bermuda grass in there and growing, uh, which means probably thinning out the Poa and Bent either mechanically with a phrase mower or, or, or chemically if it's an option for you. Um, and then planting the Bermuda grass in the spring, having it grow, fill in over the summertime and then plant the bluegrass that, uh, that fall, excuse me. And if, if, if somebody has bluegrass and wants to transition to blue muda and get Bermuda grass in, that's an option as well. We just have to, again, thin out the bluegrass, plant in Bermuda grass, make sure that we're not killing the bluegrass by phrase mowing or, or uh, uh, slit seeding, uh, vertical mowing, something to, to thin out the bluegrass, but uh, to get that Bermuda grass established. So it'd be the same process as POA and uh, bank grass, thinning it out, getting the Bermuda grass cut in and uh, to really manage for the Bermuda grass with increased fertility and stuff during the summertime that first year. Okay, and the last one. Uh, do you have any exper experience with other warm season grasses like Paspalum? And yeah, uh, not for this. Um, so I've, I've grown all sorts. I lived in the deep south United States before moving to Kentucky, and we grew all of the, uh, the warm season grasses down there. Here in, in where I live now in the transition zone, we can only grow Bermuda grass and Zoysia grass. Um, which limits us, obviously, we can't grow seashore past pallum. It doesn't have the cold tolerance to survive. But I understand in some of your coastal areas, it probably is warm enough to survive there. Uh, and so I've not tried seashore past pallum with blue muda because we can't keep it alive here. Um, and so if you've got a climate where your winters are moderate enough, where you, the past pallum is not going to, to die off, uh, and your summers are not so hot that the bluegrass will die off. It, it could be an option. Seashore past palm looks very similar to Kentucky bluegrass anyways. And so I would, I would think that would be a good mixture together, the two grasses, but you know, without ever having done it, I can't say for sure. Okay, great. So um, that was the last question, Greg. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, just let me say some words in Spanish to say goodbye. Meanwhile, if there is anyone who, who is interested in doing a question, we will give him some time. And, and please, if anybody has other questions, please email me or, or direct message me on Twitter, anything that uh, I'd be happy to, to talk with you after. Ok, thank you very much. Bueno, ya, 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 ya habéis oído al doctor Muncho. Uh, si lo que queréis contactar, pues está, tenéis a vuestra disposición su contacto por Twitter o, o el correo electrónico. Si lo queréis, os lo puedo facilitar. Uh, pues nada, uh, os recuerdo que el próximo 25 de noviembre tenemos otra, otro webinar. Esta vez lo tenemos organizado con el doctor Travis Shaddox, que también es de la Universidad de Kentucky. Nos hablará, uh, el doctor Shaddox tiene mucha experiencia en, en, en cuestiones sobre fertilización. Y bueno, será interesante también el, el tema de su charla. Eh, bueno, eh, veo que no, no hacéis ninguna pregunta, pues eh, nada, o sea, nos despediremos del profesor y a vosotros os veremos en la, en la, próxima, en la próxima edición de, de Campus del Césped. Uh, Greg. Yes. Uh, uh, again, thank you, thank you very much for your time and for your collaboration. And I told you that in this, in Spanish, that if any, anyone is interested in contacting you, uh, you are, you are, you will be glad to, to answer any question. Absolutely. Okay. So again, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to everybody, and see you next webinar. Bye bye, Greg. Bye bye. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bueno, hasta la próxima.